Yeah. Okay, guys. We're for another 10 minutes, right? We, said, we, we call it our dessert session. The first one was a main course. Now we have a little dessert. It's kind Does of funny. Every, every time you talk well, 40 minutes, it almost feels like, like five minutes only it was. <laughs> time flies. <laughs> There's, a, there's an interesting um, paragraph from, from the fifth Chabad Rebbe where he talks about one of his, his books where he, he says something, an interesting phenomena about creation. If we look at the different categories of, of creation, you have the inanimate objects like, uh, you know, a diamond. And if you take a diamond, it will always shine and be the best diamond it could possibly be. And if you move to the vegetative, if you take a vegetative in the vegetative world, you take a seed and you plant it and you put all the right conditions, it will grow to be the strongest and the best tree it could possibly be. In the animal kingdom, if you take an animal and, and let it free and let it do what it needs to do, it will be the strongest and best animal it can possibly be. But then people who have this unique ability to speak and to understand things from others' perspective, others perspectives, you can take a human and he can lie in his bed and he can't be bothered. <laughs> And he, he has all his whole his talents and he's just uh uniqueness and it's the only thing in creation the only uh well, that seems from, to have the ability to yeah. just uh and from and from such person standpoint he's probably the best he can be <laughs> <laughs> that's something else the, Rebbe, the Rebbe's talk a lot about you know the fact that man is um both a mixture of angel and animal you know and uh they're always fighting each other you know, like in the cartoons, the little angel on one shoulder and the devil on the other. And it's, uh, but that is, that is the part of reality of being human. It's, um, you know, uh, what was that poem from T.S. Eliot? Love, love is the name behind the uh, infernal hands, that, the hands that wove the infernal shirt of flame, which humans cannot remove. We only breathe, we only suspire, consumed by either fire or fire. I mean, he's talking about the fact that we have this struggle that goes on all the time. We can't escape it. It's just part of being human. It's uh, We have to more like dance with it. He talks about the dance, you know, of finding that still, uh, the still place where, which as he calls movement, but not movement. It's, um, you know, it's... Uh, the Rebbe, interesting, had when we're talking about infinity, he says that the nature of the finite is it stops and it starts and it stops, where infinite just continues nonstop. And he said, anytime you take on yourself a mitzvah or to do good for people or charity or tzedakah, and you do it continuously, you're taking, uh, you're attaching yourself in a little way to the to God who's infinite because that's anything that's continuous has the tom, has the taste of uh, infinity to it. Anyway, that's just some thoughts. Mm -hmm. Is there a concept of sacrifice outside of religion? Oh, I think for work, sure. I think uh, work. people work, working extra hours, they consider to be making a sacrifice for the company. Also in, in the war, people would People will, soldiers will jump on the machine gun ambrosaurs, sacrificing their body to protect their bodies. So that would be more for an ideology. Okay, not religion, for an ideology. Sacrifice. No, not, not ideology. Sacrifice. They were just like their bodies, their friends, their friends. They, 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 they're amazed how brave the Russians were in uh, World War II. I mean, not you know, being atheist mostly, although I think a lot more people are religious than let on. But, you know, and they, uh, they, Massive numbers of them died, you know, in the German assault, but uh, they kept fighting. Like, Sounds familiar. <laughs> yeah, like the Ukrainians now, yeah. So so why, what would drive someone to jump on a bomb, like to save his friends? Like, is, like what? what he... Altruism. <laughs> Altruism. Altruism. Yeah, it, and it's, it, well, it's interesting. I was just listening to talk about that, that, uh, that, it's built, it's, it's, we're wired for altruism because um, in the big picture of the society and of the family and the extended clan, for people altruistic, the clan survives better. You're more likely, no, it's like the whole, what they call the, the uh, 
the problem of the commons. I think it's an English idea. If everybody uses it fairly and doesn't overuse this common area for hunting and for you know, things like that, then it, everybody gets the benefit of it. But oh, if yes. people start trying to abuse it and you know take more than their fair share, then everybody suffers. And the idea of altruism is like that problem of the commons that uh, it, if everybody shares that view, then the entire you and your family and your clan all will do better in the end. And the, uh, the ultimate goal is that our children and grandchildren should survive and continue after us. I've seen it growing up in Russia, uh, in, in, in no, uh, having mostly non-religious friends, including myself. I saw uh, in my in my younger days a lot of ac a lot of actions that people did with no benefit to themselves, and then they sacrifice, like you said, work, uh, maybe not necessarily their lives, like jumping a machine gun, but they did things that. Well, let's see, somebody needs a ride, so listen, I need to get a ride. So the guy gets right. Where do you have to go? Uh, to the bus station, five minutes, no problem. What if, what if it's right, not the bus station, but to Haifa, three hours. Well, sorry, it's kind of too far. And some people say, well, if you really need it, I mean, I have like a sister there and it's very critical. I, I, I tell you the story. I mean, um, the guy, I was, I was in uh, a lot one time for the conference and uh, I, 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 I woke up in the morning, it was, maybe 10 years ago or more. And it was like maybe six, seven o'clock in the morning before eight o'clock coffee started. And I went to do, to do the prayers. I didn't know much about this little hotel, like a little beautiful like garden type hotel. And I am uh, and I want to do my morning chakrit prayers. All of a sudden comes a little guy with no keep or nothing, another religious guy with a blue uniform, maintenance man, comes in a typical Israeli with a broom, boom, 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 cleans, cleans everything. And then tells me like this, like, what are you sitting here for praying? We have a synagogue. What do you think? We don't have a synagogue? Go ahead and synagogue. You have to pray in the synagogue. You can't just sit here and pray. Go and sit right here, right around the corner. And I said, why? Well, it's, it's, it's very nice there. We have books. We have everything. I clean all the time. It's nice. Go here, here, here. So come, come to, like I'm annoyed that I am not taking benefit. So I came in and then he came home. He doesn't go to Shach. He keeps going. Was, or another example, you know, the guy is driving, non-religious guy is driving from a lab towards Jerusalem, and it's Friday. And uh, all of a sudden, the Hasid is waving, they need, they need a ride. So the guy pulls over, he, he, other people getting a ride, he doesn't give them a ride. This Hasid guy, he gives them a ride. He comes into Ju Jerusalem, even though he goes to Tel Aviv, he makes a turn, goes to Jerusalem, drops the guy off. And it's, so by then, it's like Friday, close to Shabbat. Turns around and keeps on going where he was going, to the beach. And goes to the beach and have a great time also about at the beach yep. having barbecues and all. People do that all the time. But he knows that to this guy, I have to get him to use because he's a religious guy, it's important to him. That's a sacrifice. Nothing for it's not for him, but he knows him. He doesn't even believe in what this guy believes fully, but he knows it's important to him. I'll do it. So I see that all the time. Rabbi would say that's the pit to lay in, you know. A little uh, spark from God that or my my my, co my cousin my cousins live in Ein Harod Meuchad near Fula, and I used to go there. And they have a little stable, a little synagogue there. It's like half Sephardi, half Ashkenazi synagogue. And this is and Ein Harod Meuchad is a super anti-religious kibbutz. Used to be it it chipped away from Ein Harod because Ein Harod was very socialist, but not communist enough. So they dropped, they chipped off to become Ein Harod Meuchad. I'm 70 years ago. So one of the, and the, and the real, they, real companies, the real, one of the first thing is they did made a synagogue. They go, right. they're the guys who go on a Shabbat working on the fields and they definitely make point. I'm going, not going to Shabbat. I don't believe in this. You guys, I do this. They, they made a point. Even I don't have to go on Shabbat. I will to show you how they I'm never set it. foot in. <laughs> yeah, so they did this, but they yet to build a synagogue. These people who are anti, not only the neutral to religion, the anti religious, and they made synagogue. I asked him, he says, Is this like his? And one guy was there, and he said, This is like their grandparents, the one who did that. So, why did they do it? He says, Well, they didn't believe in God, but but they had to make synagogue for, for, for their mom and dad. My father and mother is religious, so I had to get synagogue from them. I don't believe in this stuff, but for them, I had to do it. And now it's flourishing. So when you think about it, that's altruistic Jewish, and maybe not only Jewish nature, that's the right thing to do. 
I, I know this guy. Yes, sorry. Honor thy father and thy mother. Yes. I, yes. So I know this guy who lives in a yeshuv called um, Shizaf. And the, the vision of this yeshuv Shizaf is that you have religious and non religious people living together. But this guy is he's secular, but he's fascinated by religion. But he told me he can't become religious because there needs to be non religious people in the yeshuv. That's the whole vision of the yeshuv. And if he becomes religious, then it's going to ruin the, the vision. So he has to stay non religious. <laughs> he, has a, he has a mission to fulfill. <laughs> <laughs> Very interesting. Very interesting. How we're spanning the big territories today, from infinity to finite religion, non religion. It's all. It's all within infinite. It's all included. Yeah. <laughs> if if we if we get cut off because we only have ten minutes, less than ten minutes now, probably five minutes left. If you get cut off, any any particular topic you want to touch on? Well, we started on uh, Pesach, right? How to celebrate Pesach, and we wandered into this even more interesting topic we discussed instead. Should we do Pesach next uh, Tuesday, or any 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 ideas? What do we want to do, or nothing? Free, kind of. Think about it during the get, week. Did you get the um, piece by Chaim Ben Man I sent? Yes, I, yes. Sent yes. I read it. Yes, I did too. Uh, I hope it uh, resonates with some. Uh, <laughs> which which piece was that? Maybe I didn't get it. Should have been a, uh, did you were you able to send it round to everybody? So the email. You John, the email? Sent it, John sent it by email. I sent uh, it as an yeah. attachment to my email. I think Lev sent so many uh, emails this week. No, no, it uh, didn't come from uh, me. It came from John. Yeah, but yeah. Oh, I think I saw it when you. Okay. I know, it got lost in the welter. <laughs> Maybe you can resend it so the room can see it. I sent it, it, it to you again, and you can send it to the group because you know okay. where the address is. Okay. So in interesting uh, hierarchy of pleasures, which is mentioned in this is very. It's mentioned in the same book of the, from the Fritz Chabad Rebbe, like in the next next part actually, where he talks about the different different levels of pleasure that there are in this world. So he mentions that the the lowest level of pleasure is any instant gratification, like an animalistic pleasure, something you should get instant gratification. For example, food, eating, good food. So the next level up is music where it takes a bit more time and it's a little bit more subtle and you've got to have a little bit more understanding. But then they said the third one is, is, um, is character traits that are not natural. So I guess this would be altruistic character traits, something where it's difficult for you. You really have to go out of your way in order to do something. And, and sometimes you even lose because of it. So that's like a next level of pleasure. And so the next level on top of that is the intellectual or, or understanding, grasping a concept, understanding something. And uh, so this is unique to humans that we have this ability. But when uh, humans, this is this main strive in life. This is your, uh, the pleasure that you seek, that you go after. You're being more human than you are being, you know, you're, you're expressing that higher level of being human um, over, over animals. Um, you also mentioned there's another pleasure on top of that, which is connecting to God. And uh, but uh, it's just interesting. It's um, to have this whole breakdown. Mm -hmm. So altruism, I guess, is you know people understand it and experience it, know what it is. It is um, it's it's a higher level of pleasure. I think a Buddhist would say it was nirvana. Nirvana. <laughs> detachment from the outside world. From what little I know of Buddhism. So wouldn't think, that be beyond intellect though? That would be like the next, you know, connecting connecting to God, I guess. I think Beatles were very much into it. George Harrison, I think, was very much very religious guy. He was into the Hinduism and you know, my ideas sweet, that are all my sweet lord suffering is based from, on that. They say suffering comes from uh, attachment to um, impermanent things, you know. Uh, attachment to friends, family, uh, money, everything. Uh, and that if you can detach yourself, you can still enjoy those things, but if you can detach yourself through, um, you know, I guess meditation and uh, working on yourself, you can eventually get to a point where you're really at peace. And that's... Um, so there is this fascinating concept. You see it in, I think, almost every religion. You have you have uh, the Christians who at some point they, they like... Uh, you know, crawl on their knees and they hurt themselves, or people cut themselves or separate themselves. Flagellation, too. 
Yeah, like or or you had this guy like a few years ago who 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 killed his his daughter and his wife because he loved them so much, um, as like a sacrifice to, to like this, this seems to be this concept that to break when a person breaks themselves they seem to be able to get a greater kind of uh, connection out of it, um, you know I think in Judaism we also have that, that I mean this is one of the big things of the Baal Shem Tov is that before the Baal Shem Tov time. There used to be a lot of um, fasting. Jews used to do a lot of fasting or even put themselves in exile and roam around like as homeless people in order to really try and break themselves. And um, roll, roll around, the, around in the snow. Yeah. yeah, or fire ants, all ridiculous things. Yeah, and, and one of the teachings of the Baal Shem Tov that was very unique at the time was, you know, a person needs to have a very healthy, strong body in order to serve Hashem with all their, their faculties. And if a person injures themselves, you're just not able to do that. So the question is, how are you able to still, I don't know, kind of break yourself or make yourself a, a, a you know, this have the same kind of effect of the sacrifice or whatever we were just discussing and still be able to connect? So we said, well, in place of that, you would have the, the impulsive actions that a person has. You know, all the things that we crave and feel like doing just to self serve ourselves and to feel good. He says, if you abstain from that, you also can break yourself as also like a sacrifice to a certain degree that can still uh, make but, a person. Uh, but but let me but let me ask you this question, I mean, I, the, I, I thought about Talmud says that we it's not good to abstain from the things that are allowable to you. It's one thing to go indulge itself to excesses. Another one to deny yourself wine or deny yourself pleasure, not to play a basketball or play a guitar or something like this. I think I, I always thought about it. Talmud says, be around the wrong person. I mean, if you have a steak and you can say, I'm not going to eat the steak because it's too good and it's not right, I'm going to stick with just small cutlets, just a little uh, base stroganoff, which is not. Well, why not to have a steak if you can afford it? So the explanation of there is to, if well, you need the steak. Yes, yeah, sorry. The Rebbe's, uh, exp the Rebbe explained that. Um, Somebody said, why don't we wear, have, you know, it says that potel techelet and the tzitzis were supposed to have a thread of blue. So where's the thread of blue? Why don't we have it? He said, in previous times, the thread represents the gvura and the severity and the white represents chesed or kindness. And um, in previous times, people uh, could tolerate severity and uh, it helped them. But he says, in our generation, we're too weak. We can only tolerate kindness and niceness. And uh, so we no longer have the blue because we can't tolerate the uh, the severity. So I think it's the same thing. We People now would be repelled by religion if they try to you know, enforce the kind of severity that was common and self-denial that was common in the past. I think it's now it's more just a matter of finding a balance, you know, uh, but not going to extremes. But even in the past, why? Why in the past I had to deny some some pleasures? So so far, I'll give it it's a... not denying. It's it, the, the, the Ralter Rebbe and the Tanya says that we should, um, we should only do those things which help to serve our help in our service of God. So if something nice to eat once in a while is good for us and cheers us up and makes us more receptive to Torah, then sure, go ahead and eat nice things. But if you're doing it just to gratify your own pleasure, uh, yeah. the standard thing is that, you know, there's uh, the there's Kedusha, then there's the Klippo, there's Klippo Timaeus, the things which are totally forbidden, you know, adultery and murder and so forth. And then there's uh, Klippo Snoga, which is a neutral Klippo. But he said, basically, um, the point of a chassid is to... Um, what uh, what is uh, what's completely usher that's forbidden, and what's permitted like clippus noga is unnecessary. We should take that attitude of uh, you know I haven't been successful at that, but that's the ideal you know is to uh, to eliminate the things that are unnecessary and that don't uh, advance our service of God. I, I want I want I want to share something with you. I, we have a good friend. My my wife my wife is a massage therapist and a physical therapist assistant. And when she went to school years ago, her good her professor became good friend Karen her name. And every so often, and, and she is like very into the health diets. They are they opposite to you guys. No no offense, doctors. She believes in all natural remedies, so no aspirins, everything. Well, extreme like this. 
So, you know, my wife happens to take a point in between that you need both and you need to know when and what. But I talked to her mm -hmm. and it's interesting, she told me about Corona. I said, what's your view of Corona? I said, Karen, are you the conspiracy theorist? Like I know some that Corona is just conspiracy or you do believe it's a natural cause. It's like, what is it? So she said, listen, I tell you from a religious standpoint and she's not that religious, but she's religious so on. And she's saying, as a, as a medical person, I'll tell you, when the person continuously gets infections and the immune system kicks in to fight it, uh, you can handle it. But if it's something problematic, and I believe, she said, I believe that a lot of sickness is coming from the, the spiritual malady to something, a physical malady to spiritual consequences, the person have to do something. And, and we say, ah, yeah, it's okay. And then God gives you another one. Now it gives you a flu, gets you the pneumonia, gets you this, gets you that, gets you that. And you go through the, you, you're sick for a week, you're sick for two weeks, you get this antibiotics, you get this uh, antibiotics, you go this, and, and, and you get recovered. But eventually it gets to a point that the body no longer can recover. And then it can recover. And then he says, you need a major reset. And she says, Corona is sent to the world because why is it so sophisticated? God also made Corona. It has all these little pimples and dimples and DNA and those kinds. It's kind of a semi-intelligent thing. She said, it goes to the immune system and gives it a major boost. It shocks you so hard that you finally have to get it. And during this boost, she says, many times it shakes the immune system to the point that it cures even the earlier diseases that you might have had for 30 years. So now it's just, it shakes you up to such a point because, but it's, it also gives you so, so psychological, so you, you get it. You have to get it why it's happening. So I thought about it, you know, it's interesting view on the corona, not from a God forbid standpoint, but how God considered that not only warning for us, but also even not only on spiritual level, but even on, on mechanistical doctors level, medical level, it says this is a super duper injection of a special proteins and genetic code in order to really fix something to you that the doctors couldn't fix for two years. You might have a you might have like some problem with lungs. I have some of course, God forbid, some people pay ultimate price with it. That's unfortunate. But if you survive, okay, where to you, that, where you, what do you I, I lost the train of what you're trying to say? What she's saying is, yeah, I'm not sure any doctors would 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 go with this one. She's, she's uh, saying she's saying there's some medicine that God sent. I'm not sure the her. science behind this. I so, don't know the science behind this. Sounds so fishy strong, to me. So 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 powerful that it, it doesn't look like a good cure, but God actually sends us as a cure, not just unfortunate. So COVID flu. is a, COVID is something to uh, to give us supercharged our immune system. Is that the idea? Yeah, I guess something like that. She's saying. Does the immune system work like that? Is there even such a is there such a thing? I'm not, this is the uh, well, and doctors. Say, the doctors. <laughs> I don't. I don't. The only know. thing I can say is interesting. Is um, it's an interesting idea. Apparently, no? yeah, it's it's been studied that children who are exposed to a lot of natural infections in their early years are less likely to develop allergies. The theory being that we have a primary set of lymphocytes that fight infection early on and then days that could get sort of used up fighting infections and they clear out of the way and then their adult lymphocytes come in when we're you know a little older um maybe uh, late childhood or early teens and that if we are living in a too sterile environment the uh the um Pediatric lymphocytes never get fully used and they somehow interfere with the development of a normal healthy immune system. You know, another theory being that that constant um, stimulus of these uh, viruses and germs on our body uh, strengthens the immune system. It's also been studied that um, children who grow up in farms, for instance, exposed to a large, large variety of uh, antigens and germs and things, uh, they're also less likely to get uh, allergies. So it's, well, uh, I tell you, it have to survive yeah. the first few years, huh? um, it, in a natural environment without modern medicines and vaccines, children died. But yeah, well, they're talking about the modern era where they, you know, you can treat a lot of these things. But no, of course, uh, no, I remember reading a uh, uh, 
a book called The uh, Horse and Buggy Doctor about a doctor who went to Northwestern Medical School in 1885. Mm -hmm. But he said when he was a child, diphtheria was the scourge. And uh, yeah. the book starts off with um, his mother crying and the father saying, that's another one. It was a farmhouse down the road with nine children. And over the period of two weeks, eight of the nine children died of diphtheria. Right. And they're just constantly having horse and wagons uh, taking coffins down there and bringing the kids back to be buried. So yeah, it's um, we don't appreciate sometimes how much modern medicine does now, but uh, mm -hmm. um, but but can it be for uh, uh, John and Ruben for you the doctors? Can does does it make sense possibly that a very strong infection like this can boost the system to the point that it, it cures even some chronic things the person have had for years and no other medicine can take care of it, and this happens to be happens to do it. All it does at a bunch of baloney. What do you say, Dr. Well, John? Theory, but I'd like to see the evidence. Well, there, I, I tell example. I just. Comment. I'm sorry? Because it's just somebody's theory. Um, well, I, 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 give you, I give you interesting you things. I, 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 I'm just recovering from Corona. My wife and I had a Corona for about now almost a week, right? We're almost done. I had a temperature almost 39. Ruben went through Corona a couple of maybe months ago or so. And as Ruben knows, every time we ride bikes, I always complain to him too that I have a sour taste in my mouth, this and this and this. My tongue have always been like white, white and uh, grayish, like something with a stomach sometimes, stomach infection or something, tongue, white. And I had it for years and every so often I, I, I couldn't figure out and all the uh, pulmonologists and what do you call it, uh, stomach doctors and uh, well say nothing wrong with you. All the analysis shows fine. And I say, why my stomach burn? No, my, my tongue burns all the time. Look at the color doctor, stick my tongue out. It's all white and gray. He says, no, I don't know. It just happens. Sometimes it's called acid. Uh, after I have this Corona, look at my, look at my tongue. It's now red. It's a little bit white, mostly red. It's never been as red as, as, uh, as it is now after finish with Corona. So maybe Corona kills whatever germs are had that causes whiteness of the tongue. But whiteness of the tongue is not a disease. It's but, just whiteness of the tongue. No, but it's also burning. You sure still have burning? You still have the burning? No. It's just the way you are. No, burning disappeared. Oh, I, the, but Mizrach Hashem, it will stay like that. I mean, I don't have to say next next Tuesday, guys. It's again. Okay. <laughs> I thought he had burning tongue syndrome. It's actually a syndrome. It's not yeah. what causes it. But you know, the, the whole world is interconnected. We never know how things will interact. It's um, you know, you could say God sent the corona to heal our immune system. This Rabbi Kesson uh, speaks from Brooklyn on uh, uh, YouTube says that uh, Corona was sent by God because um, of um, sins that are in the Torah are deserving of um, the death sentence, Chai of Misa, in particularly sexual sins and abortion. And uh, that the fear of death uh, compensates for a, uh, um, a sin that requires um, actual death. So between the deaths of Corona and the fear of dying, it's a correction for um, you know a sinful uh, a sinful world. Interesting theory. Now yeah. people yeah come up with these things. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, I've got to go now. I have okay. Uh, well, we we're yeah. coming to a, a little bit past yeah. our extra ten limits. Next Tuesday at the same time, eight o'clock, gentlemen. Okay. Yeah. And the topic good... maybe maybe we'll catch up on Pesach or 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 else. Or we'll catch up on us. That's right. We'll catch it's up on us. cleaning tips. Yeah. Okay. Excellent, gentlemen. <laughs> Shavuot Tov. We'll skip to our wives, right? <laughs> <laughs> Regards. We'll to sit everybody. and discuss it, right. and they'll do it. The action and the. Uh... Okay. okay. Have a good one. <laughs> All right, guys.